You want me? On a wintry Monte Carlo afternoon, Helmut Newton shoots the new glossy spring catalog. Scandal has often stalked the work of both Helmut Newton and Saint Laurent in their controversial representations of women. Today, it's more commerce than art. Oh, I'm a great fan of it, you know, he's a, he's a great master. But I don't know whether I like that picture. Yeah, wait a minute, I mean, the picture looks stupid. Well, do you think it looks dumb? Well, it looks, it's not okay. fascinating, I no, must admit. No, it's not fascinating. It's not fascinating. Yeah, it's not fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Helmut Newton is not always fascinated by more recent aspects of Yves Saint Laurent's ready-to-wear collection. I don't like a woman that's 150% feminine, which what I've just photographed now, of course, is 150% feminine. It's very, yeah, but it's also very you know, sort of cute and uh, corn-fed looking. Helmut Newton is reminded of a more radical past. There's a picture that I uh, took in 1975 of, uh, in the street where I lived in Paris at night of a woman in a, in a suit, in a double-breasted suit, and uh, it's a spurt of the way he, he saw women at the time, and it's the way I like to see women. Oh, shit. Don't worry about the hair. All right, stay like this, Tal. Good. No, that's perfect. Don't move now. Time seems to have caught up with the young radical, who now designs for the well-heeled establishment he once shocked. The fingers were like that, I see them. Good, 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 good. In 1967, the first of 120 Yves Saint Laurent ready-to-wear franchises opened in London's Bond Street, selling clothes, accessories, and perfume. The young ones of the 60s can now be seen initiating their young ones into the art of the Yves Saint Laurent spending spree. Hello, Claire. We've come to look for Claire's 21st big occasion. Claire, how wonderful. Lucky yeah. you. So we don't know quite what. Claire's yes. got some ideas. But Hi, maybe so my husband is making Maybe we can just share a few other things and make sure it really is what she wants. Something for a party. Yes. Right. Superb. In gold leather. She did love that. It's a bit restricting, isn't it? Yeah. This. Who's That will be lovely on you. Happily, there were veterans on hand to show how it's done. Yes, the colour here is perfection. Good. That's one thing done. And that's two and three and four. Everybody has a budget nowadays, and particularly now. But I'm not under sort of pressure. Uh, it's left to my discretion. <laughs> no pressure at all if you've got around $15,000 for a seasonal outlay. So there's the classic smoking. This one. That's the one. <laughs> well, I've probably been looking at my mother's cupboard now for 20 years and dreaming of buying Yves Saint Laurent myself. And she's always had, like, you know, the smoking suit. And I just think that is Saint Laurent. I mean, it looks like Saint Laurent. It has that wow quality about it. And I've always, always wanted the smoking suit, ever since I could remember it. With Le Smoking now a staple of the wealthy wardrobe, surely Yves Saint Laurent must eat his words. I detest the bourgeois. I detest the leur esprit, leur, leur intransigeance, <laughs> leur goût, leur goût aussi, oui. But it's that very taste-buying $1,500 suits that he has to thank for his ready-to-wear success. Yes, it is expensive, but I really think it's going to last for many, many years. And I do feel that with Saint Laurent Clears, that the initial outlay actually pays for itself at the end of the day, because you can wear the clothes for so many years and readapt them. Um, but the actual initial expensive outlay over the years, I think it does pay itself off, actually. But the big payoff came when the designer who hated the bourgeoisie and a businessman who wanted to be an artist struck a licensing deal that took the exploitation of an elite fashion business into the mass marketplace. I don't like business very much. I like art. The perfumier's art the launch of Y brought him $2 million profit from the start. And I don't like money. 
Gott der Tod. I don't respect money, in fact. The impact of Eve's naked body was nothing to disturb what he, Berger, and Charles of the Ritz whipped up in 1977 when they launched a new perfume, shockingly named Opium. At $100 an ounce, the heady spicy scent sold more in a month than Chanel No. 5 did that year. Opium ads offended the American Chinese community and were banned in Australia as an encouragement to hard drug taking. The entire launch was a publicity coup. They took a Chinese, um, Chinese junk and uh, had it in the East River uh, down by South Street Seaport. And the whole thing was covered with lanterns and lit up. And they had a, a dinner on this Chinese junk then they had a fireworks show afterwards, and they spelt out Yves Saint Laurent and fireworks over the East River, and then opium over the East River. The temptations of perfume licensing, grossing $500 million a year, proved addictive. I'm a businessman just because I was obliged to be a businessman. What can I do? I, I did the opium perfume campaign for Yves Saint Laurent for eight years, and um, the first few years, they didn't pay me very well. But the last few years, they started, you know, paying me well. And he was so furious about it, you know. And about so every, paying you? Mm, oh. Every time that he saw me, he'd always say, you're so expensive. You're much too expensive. You know, it's outrageous how much money you're getting, you know. And uh, eventually, they got someone else, you know. In the late 70s and early 80s, Yves Saint Laurent perfume and products were bringing in huge licensing fees. But the murmurings of discontent with the fashion collections was why they were being subsumed to product marketing. But the genie was out of the bottle and wasn't going back. As Berger has said, Yves Saint Laurent, the man, had become a label. Having sold Saint Laurent's name and made millions, Berger had a plan to get it back and make even more. He teamed up with De Benedetti. They raised an enormous amount of debt to buy back the perfumes, which transformed the finances of Saint Laurent as a business, gave them control over their perfumes, allowed them to defray their marketing costs. It really was of inestimable advantage to them. He then managed to go public and he raised capital, so he paid off a lot of the debt. But the structure of the deal for going public enabled Berger and the founding shareholders of Saint Laurent to retain control of the business. So in financial terms, it was an astonishing coup, and it was something that sort of so-called serious mainstream big businessmen really haven't been able to replicate. So you've got to admire him for that. Because in uh, one day, on est passé d'une uh, entreprise commerciale uh, grande réputation, mais quand même un petit peu pas très grande, en une multinationale qui couvre le monde entier. The company was moving further and further away from Eve's source of inspiration, fashion, which now accounted for only one-tenth of the business. With the burden of licensing deals, makeup lines, perfume, and now skincare products on his shoulders, Yves Saint Laurent, the icon of the French fashion industry, struggles on. Some say just to satisfy the shareholders. 